In The Silver Chair, Northrop Fry, the, the great literary critic, said, there is a major pattern that we can find in most of literature, this kind of mythic literature, and that's the descent from a high place to a lower place, and then a descent from that low place to a farther lower place, then an ascent from that bottom place up to the middle place again, and then an ascent back up to the high place. We find that very clearly in the Apostles' Creed, where we find that Jesus was born of a virgin. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, so he came down to this, and he, he suffered. He came first descent. And then he did what? He died, was crucified, died, and buried, and he descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again, and then he ascended into the Father. So you've got this kind of pattern that Northrop Fry sees in much of literature, coming first from heaven to earth, earth to hell, hell back up to earth, and then back up to heaven. And we're going to find that there. But before we do, we're going to start because we're very close to Mardi Gras and Fat Tuesday and the last time we can deal with food. So we're going to look at a little bit of food uh, in the silver chair. Remember when, when uh, Jill Cole and, and Eustace are sent to Narnia, basically to rescue Prince Caspian's son, who is Rillian. And they are brought in, and when they're brought in, they're separated because they're fooling around, and they just act like teenagers. Jill arrives, and she's very thirsty. She sees a stream of just delicious water, but there is a lion standing between her and the stream, and she does not want to go near the lion. So she begins to talk to him, and basically the lion is saying, if anyone thirst, let him come through me and drink. This comes from John, the woman at the well. But she doesn't want. She says, is there any other stream I can drink from to satisfy my thirst? And the lion says, no, this is the only stream that will satisfy your thirst. And so she has to somehow submit to that. Later on, we find the owls are taking the two children um, on, on the way, and one of the owl glim feathers snatches a bat out of the air and offers it to Jill. And she asks if she wants a nice juicy bat. And, Lou, and she, Jill says, in polite terms, no, thank you. I'd rather wait for something else. <laughs> We're told that centaurs, half man, half horse, have two stomachs, each of which must be fed, fed breakfast. Kidney and bacon and omelets, hot mash, oats, and a bag of sugar. That's why it's such a serious thing to invite a center home for the weekend. <laughs> he will eat you out of house and home. Uh, they arrive at Hargang, which is a city of giants for the autumn feast. It sounds wonderful. There are lollipops for the children, and there's a little kind of hot roast turkey, steamed pudding, roasted chestnuts. But then Puddle Glum, who is a marsh wiggle. Now, a marsh wiggle is kind of a tall, thin, skinny character that is very frog-like, has webbed feet, uh, one of the best characters that Lewis has ever invented. Uh, and this, this Marsh Wiggle, we'll, we'll get to him later, is called Puddle Glum. But as he's eating one food, he begins to realize that he has eaten a talking stag. And Lewis kind of inserts here the idea of cannibalism and also the idea from Leviticus of kosher foods. There are certain foods you do not eat. And so he feels very guilty and feels like there's a curse upon him. Now, the children are meant to be the special guests at this autumn feast. The autumn feast was a traditional Celtic feast in ancient Britain. And at this feast is usually a ritual involving human sacrifice. If you've ever read or seen The Wicker Man, this is the kind of idea of sacrificing this person. The grand idea of the autumn feast is that Jill and Eustace are to be the feast. They're invited to the feast, but they're going to be there. They find this out by sneaking into the kitchen. And when they sneak into the kitchen, they read the cookbook. And they see the recipes for man and for marsh wiggle. It says on marsh wiggle, nobody wants to eat marsh wiggle. It's a stringy consistency and a muddy flavor. <laughs> it is horrible. It doesn't agree with your digestion. But after a very long boil, maybe you could do something with it. <laughs> But a recipe for man, he says, this elegant little biped has long been valued as a delicacy. It forms a traditional part of the autumn feast and is served between the fish and the joint. <laughs> and so it's a shock for the children to see that they're on the menu. Um, I don't know how many of you remember this wonderful kind of Twilight Zone episode 
when the aliens came and they wanted to, they gave mankind a book. It said, How to Serve Man. And the people on Earth were just so amazed. Well, they want to serve us. This is great. But they needed someone to translate the book. But, but finally, one guy says, No, this is great. He wants to serve us. And uh, he starts to get on the plane, and his woman calls out, It's a cookbook, How to Serve Man. Okay? <laughs> and so this kind of twist here that comes through. Now, the two themes for today are education and enchantment. I have always argued that education is wasted on the young. <laughs> it's only after college that we begin to realize how much we missed by not going to all of our classes, how much we missed by not getting to know the professors. The, the one thing is, I, I tell my students, I says, do you think it is better to know the material in the book or to know me? And when you put it that way, they go, we want to know you. Okay, the grade at the end will be much different when you know the professors. And so when you go to college, go and meet the professors. Ask them questions. Make them feel vain. Make them feel like they understand everything. And you will do so much better. Now, much of this is autobiographical. L Lewis is talking about his own experiences in school, and they were never happy. He had a horrible, miserable time in a boarding school. In fact, his first headmaster, the Reverend Robert Capron, was certified insane in 1910, the year after he left. He would whip and chastise the boys, treat them horribly. The only thing he did in math was make them do sums over and over again, the same sums. And so Lewis was never very good at math. In fact, he was almost not admitted to Oxford because he could never pass the math exam. The only thing that got him in was his service in World War I. Veterans were allowed to kind of be enter into Oxford without passing math. And so he never learned math and still became kind of this great person. In fact, in Lewis, in Surprise by Joy, his autobiography calls this school a concentration camp. So you can see how much he really detested it. He also said that children lived in terror of these things. In the opening pages of The Silver Chair, Lewis wrote that it was a dull autumn day and Jill Pohl was crying behind the gym. She was crying because they had been bullying her. This is not going to be a school story, so I shall say as little as possible about Jill's school. Again, he twists it all because he talks a lot about schools. <laughs> Jill's school, which is not a pleasant subject, was co-educational, a school for both boys and girls which used to be called a mixed school. Some said it was not nearly so mixed as the minds of the people who ran it. <laughs> so he goes on, he says, what they, they allow in this school is for the, the larger children to bully the little ones. And it is this idea of bullying that continues on here. He detested such schools where favoritism and bullying dominated. And he skipped the sports club. Uh, he became a marked man. The only place he could get away was, was the library. Whenever they were playing games, he would sneak away to the library. Now, Lewis also provides examples of stupid education, of how we don't learn. And the one stupid education is with the giants. Now, giants are usually defined as anyone over 5'5". Five, five. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Those are just giants, yeah. okay. <laughs> now, it's it, normal. It, it is, it's so strange, you know. So. <laughs> Experience does not teach these giants. When these giants get into an argument, what do they do? They take big clubs and hit each other over the heads. They hurt so much, they begin to howl. But in a few moments, they forget their pain, and they start all over again. They hit each other again, and they howl. It's like learning by touching a hot stove. We should learn that it burns, and one should be enough, even as we should learn to avoid certain topics with certain people but we have a tendency to bring those topics up again and again to kind of irritate them and get hit on the head. We are the giants of this world. Um, you, you all may know for decades now, they've been giving the Darwinian Awards, yeah. and the Darwinian Awards honor those who have removed themselves from the gene pool because of their stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones who have done something so stupid that they kill themselves or do damage to themselves. One of my favorite was the thief who went into a grocery store and he stole two live lobsters and he stuffed them down the front of his pants. <laughs> he didn't make it to the front of the store or have any children, okay? The Darwinian Awards, we thank him that there are no more like him along. But Lewis gives us examples of good education. First of all, he gives us old Trumpkin. Old Trumpkin is as old as dirt. 
He is a teacher as deaf as a post and quite peppery. A gruff old teacher, frightening students, but his eyes would twinkle all the time. In the Parliament of Owls, the other owls imitate Trumpkin's voice as students make fun of their teachers. You're a mere chick. I remember when you were just an egg. <laughs> Don't come trying to teach me, sir, crabs and crumpets. And all the owls begin to laugh at this imitation of their old cr Trumpkin, the, the, uh, the pup professor. Some begin to see that Narnians all felt about Trumpkin as people feel at school about some crusty teacher whom everyone is a little afraid of and everyone makes fun of, but nobody really dislikes. Lewis was painting a cameo of himself as a teacher in the mold of this blustering dwarf. Um, one of the things that I do in my classes when I teach film comedy is there is a night in which I give extra credit if the students will imitate one of the other professors on campus. <laughs> it is one of the most hilarious things because they are able to kind of capture just little movements and everything else. And, and I, if you want to get far, imitate your professors. Start with your, your friends and do that and see what happens if you even make it out of school. Okay, but here he puts forth with Trumpkin the idea of the British tutorial as a better way of teaching. Aslan is the tutor. At the beginning, when Jill first comes, Aslan calls her and gives her a quest to seek the lost prince. Or either until you have found him and brought him back to his father's house or else died in the whole process. How, please, said Jill. I will tell you, child, said the lion. There are four signs by which I will guide you in your quest. First, as soon as the boy Eustace sets foot in Narnia, he will meet an old and dear friend. He should greet him at once. Second, you must journey to the north of the Narnia and come to the ruined city of the ancient giants. Third, you will find writing on a stone in that ruined city, and you must do what the writing tells you. Fourth, you will know the lost prince if you find him by this that he is the first person you have met in your travels who will ask you to do something by my name, by the name of Aslan. So she has these four instructions, four basic instructions. As the lion seems to have finished, Jill thought she should say something. So she said, thank you very much, I see. Child, said Aslan in a gentle voice that he had used before. Perhaps you do not quite see as well as you think, but the first step is remember Repeat to me in order the four signs. When my wife asks me to pick up things at the grocery store, she makes me repeat what she has told me. I still forget something. But the scriptures themselves teach us about remembering. We partake of the bread and the wine in remembrance of our Lord. The Eucharist is a teacher every Sunday. Here is a tutor that values memory. First, we learn the basics. Now, Jill didn't get them right the first time. So the lion corrected her, make it repeated again and again until she had them perfectly. He was very patient with her. She finally learns them, and the lion explains he's going to blow her into Narnia. But first, he says, remember, remember, remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake in the morning and when you lie down at night, and when you wake in the middle of the night. And whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from the signs. The word of God is to be remembered and memorized and used. When we have other anxieties and worries, we can always go not to those, but to the word of God. And as we remember, we find that we are healed of those problems. But we have to remember. The Seder itself is a time of remembering, a ritual with symbolic foods where the Jews remind their children of slavery and freedom. And to engage the curiosity of their children, they repeat four questions during the Passover festival, basically asking, what is special about this night? Why do we eat certain foods? And why do we eat in a reclining position? So to remember, 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 remember. By remembering, things will be good. But secondly, Aslan says, I give you a warning. Here on the mountaintop, I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all like you expect them to when you meet them down there. That is why it is so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. On the mountaintop, we are given the signs. We are given the word. 
I think that's why when we hear the, the homily every Sunday, we are in a place where we, our mind is clear. As soon as we step out and it's Monday morning, can you remember the homily? Can you remember the lectionary reading? If you do, there's something that is very healthy about that because you're in the midst of your crisis and your chaos, and now we can remember, and things are put in order. So a good education is something that trains God's children for the desert and the wilderness. We are called to learn things in the mountains, in church, so that we can use them when we encounter danger. And Lewis wants to place that in a child's mind, that there are certain things that you must remember. I think that's why when our, we send our children off to school, we will repeat and repeat and repeat things for them to learn. Because as soon as they get to the university, they will forget and forget and forget <laughs> everything we told them. Um, the other thing I found that was really helpful, that was really strange, I just did it. I started writing my children letters to their, their college and universities with kind of just little postcard things. And what that did, if, if they got one once every two weeks, it would remind them. Now, an email, a text, everything else, it goes, by the way. But when they get something in the mail, it is something that helps remember. And so if you have grandchildren or children that, that are away, you write. This writing is something that is physical you could hold on to. And Aslan is giving us that instruction. Now, fortunately, Lewis gives Eustace and Jill another teacher, a guide. Puddle Glum is one of the most delightful, logical, and gloomy of all <laughs> teachers. He is one of the most pessimistic persons. He says, well, we may have problems with the weather, but, excuse me, but com compared to all of the dangers we're going to have, all of the other obstacles, the weather's not going to matter, even if it is awful. And, and so for him, everything is bad. He must be a Welshman. He is a Welshman, <laughs> he is a Welshman. The other person he is, is from Winnie the Pooh, is Eeyore. Eeyore. This is Eeyore put into Narnia. Uh, so you know it very well. And it's basically living proof that faith is more than optimism. If we know kind of grumpy, gloomy people, they are saints whom God has planted among us to remind us that, of what is going on. So nothing is ever going to go right, but that's okay. That's the way things are. It was modeled after Lewis's gardener, Fred Paxford. Fred Paxford was saying, I'll pull up these weeds, but I'm sure the rabbits are going to get the the lettuce anyway, it doesn't matter, but you know, I'll do it. And so all of that there. Now, at the end of the book, something delightful happens with education. Lewis tends to come back in and tamper with the educational system of Great Britain. He doesn't want to leave it as it is. And so he, he brings Prince Caspian and Prince Rillian, and they're dressed in all their armor, and Aslan, and the two other kids come back in with their swords and their power and their glory. And the other children, Adela Pennyfeather, <coughs> Edith Winterblot, it's a metaphor what winter is like for children in school, blot on the winter. Spotty Sorner, Big Bannister, and the two loathsome Garrett twins encounter something more frightening and they stop attacking. Their faces change and all the meanness, conceit, and cruelty almost disappear in one single expression. Because a wall has fallen down, a lion has come in, these two men in shining armor are there, and they start shouting, murder, lions, it isn't fair. And so then the headmaster comes out. And she sees it, and she goes berserk as well. And she goes into hysterics and rings up the police and says that there is a lion escaped here, and there are convicts and everything else. And in all this kind of excitement, Jill and Eustace slip indoors, and Rillian and Caspian and Aslan go back to Narnia, and the wall is made whole. So when the police arrive, there's no lion, no broken wall, and there's an inquiry into the whole thing, out of which all sorts of people about, at Experiment House came out, and they were 10 people were expelled. After that, the head's friends saw that the head was of no use, so they made her an inspector to interfere with other heads. <laughs> and then when they found out that she wasn't very good as a superintendent either, they got her into Parliament where she lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> so when you can't teach, they put them into administration and then into politics. I was once an administrator, but fortunately it only lasted for four years there. Finally, enchantment and appearances. In this book, there are many kind of enchanting moments. Things are not what they appear to be. Jill sees some rocks, and she says, oh, those are ugly rocks, ugly rocks, U-G-L-Y, ugly, ugly, they're really ugly rocks. But those rocks begin to move, and she recognizes those are not rocks, but giants. The giants at Harfang look very gentle and friendly enough, but we soon discover otherwise. When they encounter 
And this is one of my favorite passages. They encounter this beautiful, enchanting beauty of a green lady. This is a theme that Lewis borrowed from Coleridge. Coleridge had a poem called Christabel. In Christabel, she is a young, beautiful woman, very innocent and full of piety, and she goes out looking for her knight. She meets another fascinating, beautiful woman named Geraldine, who just happened to come in. Hi. I'm kidding. I know. I know, I know you're not. I know it's good. Um, Geraldine initially appears to be kind of a, a mirror image of Christabel, but she's far more complex and ambiguous. She's basically a vampire. And Coleridge's strange woman becomes demonic and mesmerizing. She's able to hypnotize Christabel. One sign comes early when Christabel is walking with her back to the castle, and she says, why don't we praise the Virgin? And Geraldine kind of backs off into mirrors and says, no, I'm too weary. Geraldine collects herself in scorn and pride as one defied, and she takes over Christabel, and she puts her under a drowsy spell. She takes over Christabel's father, the king, and begins to manipulate him. And then at one point, Christabel sees her spiritually turning into a green serpent. And so you see this kind of green serpent. The same theme is going to happen now with this beautiful woman that they meet. Beauty is what is going to seduce us out of this. Um, the other kind of side story of this is that Coleridge, as you know, when he was writing Kubla Khan, took a lot of opium. He had a lot of physical pain and took opium. And so he would be in this kind of narcotic enchantment, this kind of addiction that was there. And so Lewis kind of recognizing that creates this whole environment around this beautiful green enchantment um, with the, the narcotic effects of music and, and spells. Now, Puddleglum, when they're crossing over the giant city and sees the bridge and says, we've got to look out for enchantments in a place like this. I think it's a trap. He knows enchantments are coming, and he is aware of the dangers of these spells. The lovely lady of the green kirtle comes, and she uses two major techniques of enchantment or propaganda, flattery and false promises. When addressing the trio, the lady laughs, a laughter that was so lovely and well enchanting, the most musical laugh you can imagine. Well, children, you have a very wise guide with you. Using flattery, you can see the politician already talking. I think none the worse of him for keeping his own counsel, but I'll be free with mine. She directs them to the city ruin, not to the city ruinish where they're looking for, but to the castle of Hargang, where the, dwell the giant, gentle giants. She says they're mild and civil and prudent and courteous. And at Harfang, you may, not hear, you may or may not hear tidings of the city ruinish, but you'll find very good lodgings and merry hosts. You'll be wise to enter there, at least tarry there for a couple days for your ease and refreshment. Now, these people have been going across this wilderness and hardship and, and sleeping on the ground. And so she says to them, there you shall have steaming baths, soft beds, and bright hearts. And the roast and the bake and the sweet and the strong will be on the table four times a day. So it's this modern advertising, the kind of commercials we're going to see on the Super Bowl today. The promise of what we can get, the steaming bath, the soft beds, all of these things. Almost sounds like a honeymoon retreat. But it's something very seductive for all of us, for those who have had a tough time. It seems like an easy way out. The children later recognize how vulnerable they are. We were so jolly keen to get to Hargang, but we didn't bother about anything else. I shouldn't wonder, said Paraglam, that's exactly what she had intended. The wicked witch here, the green lady, uses their own desires to enchant them. She uses their own wants and hungers to pull them into her kingdom and to bewitch them. Secondly, when we meet the prince himself, he is enchanted by the green lady so much he doesn't even know his own identity. He has lost his memory because he is so addicted and under the power of this witch. The only time he is lucid is when he is tied up in a silver chair. When they come looking for the Prince Rillian, they meet this knight, who is Rillian, who wonders carelessly, Narnia? What land did you come from? I've never heard that name. It must be a thousand leagues from here. Those parts of the world I don't know. And who are you looking for, this Billion, Tillian? I don't know. He lacks a perspective about himself because he is so consumed with enchantment. But when he sits in the silver chair, he begins to wake and rouse from his enchantment. Oh, he groaned, these enchantments, these enchantments, the heavy, tangled, cold, clammy web of evil magic buried alive. It's almost as if he's coming out of a deep sleep, a narcotic after an operation, 
a coma. And he says, oh mercy, what have I been doing here? Let me out, let me go back. Let me feel the wind in the sky. I ask you in the name of Aslan, release me. Now the children had missed the first three signs. They did not remember them and they had missed them by some circumstance. But now they hear this call to release me in the name of Aslan. And Puddleglum knows what we're supposed to do. He says, whether we'll be eaten by a green serpent or whether we'll be chopped into pieces by the sword, this is what we're called to do. And so even though they're a little afraid of Rillian in the chair who seemed demonic before, they liberate him and they begin to escape. She comes back in and just before they're gone, she takes out a musical instrument like a mandolin and begins to play it with her fingers, a steady, monotonous strumming that you didn't notice after a few minutes. But the less you noticed it, the more it got into your brain and blood. This also made it hard to think. And after she strummed for a time and the sweet smell was not strong, she began speaking in a quiet voice. What are you really doing here? Who are you and where is Narnia? Have you made this place up? Is Narnia just a place you've invented? <clears throat> yes, it's all a dream, says Jill. There never was such a world. Never was any world but mine, said the witch. There was never any world but yours, they agreed. <clears throat> Lewis is, is taking us back to Plato's allegory of the cave. You remember when you begin to see those images there and you think the images are the reality. They are there. And she begins to say, no, it's not a real place. It's an imaginary place. Puddleglum fights hard. I don't know rightly what you mean by a world, he said, but you can play that fiddle until your fingers drop off and still won't make me forget Narnia. And the overworld, too. We'll never see it again, I should wonder. You may have blotted it out and turned it dark like this, for all I know. Nothing more likely. But I know I was there once. I've seen the sky full of stars. I've seen the sun coming up out of a sea of mourning. And it has a rousing effect on the children. The children recognize, of course it is, of course. The blessing upon Aslan on this mar marsh whistle. And they said, you're the only one with any sense I do believe. But then the witch's voice comes back. And it's cooing softly like the voice of a wood pigeon from the high elms of an old garden at three o'clock in the middle of a sleepy afternoon. You have the seduction of perfumes, of music, of sound, of loveliness. It's the whispers of advertising. You can put any child to sleep or congregation by speaking softly. <laughs> Can't we? <laughs> and here the witch knew how to speak sweetly, how to use the right words, very much like the Proverbs talks about the way of a man with a maid. There are ways in which to create this enchantment. But Puddleglum remembers the last few minutes, he says, there's Aslan. And she says, no, Aslan is just a little kitty cat that you've made up. He says, Aslan. And so she begins to twist everything together. But Puddleglum does a brave thing. The fire, which has been giving these fumes out, he goes over the fire and he takes his, his kind of bare web foot foot his puddle glum marsh wheel foot, and he puts it on the fire, and he stomps out the fire. And three things happen. First, he howls, because the fire hurts. The second is, a puddle glum foot connected, marsh whittle, connected with fire, when it burns, it really stinks. And if anything can wake you up, it is a bit of sulfur dioxide. When you smell something, rotten eggs, it wakes you up. And so his, his feet kind of wake them up. And then finally, she turns into a loathsome serpent. Here's where she becomes this kind of green snake. And Prince Rillian wrestles it, and he kills it, and the children escape into the open air, liberating all the little earthmen that are there as well. In closing, they get out of the underworld with all these little gnomes that they've liberated, and they begin to ascend back up to the next level. And at that next level, we find more pain still going on. Because what has happened, they find a dead King Caspian lying still in a stream. He is there, and Rillian has not been able to see his father for so many years, and he's there, and, and, and they all start weeping. Aslan himself begins to weep over the death of Caspian. However, Aslan asks Eustace to go get a thorn and to drive it into his paw. And a great drop of blood, redder than red, falls upon the old dead king in the stream. And suddenly the spell is broken with Aslan's blood, and the king's beard changes from gray, white, to gray, to no beard, to a strapling youth, full of energy and abundant life. And you find this king that was dead is now resurrected. 
And it's, it's kind of this new body and this new spirit that one has at the kingdom of God coming in heaven. And it's just a wonderful ending where he gets up and his son, the father and son, hug each other and it's delightful. From enchantment of death into life everlasting by the blood of Jesus. It is the cup of wine and blood that Christ gives to us and says, drink this in remembrance of me. Death can be and will be defeated by the blood of the lamb and the lion. And so Lewis says, remember, remember, remember. Thank you.